and uh, good evening everybody uh, uh, it's morning here in, in New York it's uh, 10 a.m. local time here uh, thank you uh, uh, you know for joining us and I'd like to thank Mile for uh, giving me giving me this opportunity to share my thoughts on customer centricity so uh, just uh, an overview here uh, customer centricity is one of uh, the three strategies that firm kind of follow to, to grow. These strategies are innovation, you know, in terms of uh, products and services, uh, cost differentiation in terms of uh, reducing costs and maximizing uh, margins, uh, merger, and merger and acquisitions. So uh, uh, today I'd like to show you, you know, how customer centricity can help a firm grow over the long term. Uh, the plan is to Uh, somehow I cannot, uh, yeah, the plan is to, for me to introduce and define what customer centricity is, then uh, uh, I'd like to talk about how to create the customer advocate or how to create customer value. We'll talk then about the reward from customer centricity, you know, and its impact on customer profitability, and I conclude with the blocks that you need to have, the building blocks that you need to have in order to have a customer-centric organization. So what does customer centricity mean? Um, let me start with an example. Uh, sometime back, like in late 70s or so, a customer uh, from Alaska went to a Nordstrom store in, in, in Alaska and uh, basically he took four worn down tires, four used tires, and asked the store to return them. The, the irony is that uh, Nordstrom never sold tires, uh, and uh, Nordstrom never sold this guy, this customer tires. So, uh, you know, Nordstrom is using this story always to show and to brag about uh, how customer centric they are. In my view, this is not about customer centricity. This is about customer friendliness. And the difference is that, yes, you can be friendly, but is this a sustainable strategy? Yes, we can deal with one customer, we can return the tires, that's fine, just to make a point. But suppose all the customers come back and bring tires, what do we do? Would you return them? Is this sustainable in the long run? Not really. So I'd like to distinguish between customer friendliness and customer centricity in what in the discussion that we'll pursue right now. There are tons of books about customer centricity. So you'll find books about one-to-one -one marketing, real-time marketing, uh, personalization, permission marketing, uh, customer intimacy, books about CRM, customer relationship marketing, books about customer equity, books about customer acquisition and retention, and books about customer life cycle management and customer loyalty. If you look at the whole map, actually there are two dimensions or two factors behind all these books. So the story could be summarized into, you know, customer value creation or customer friendliness, like what we talked about for Northam, and the other one is about value capture. How can the company capture some of the value created uh, to customers? So uh, the first part talks about friendliness, how can we make people happy uh, so that they can come back. The other part talks about how can, uh, uh, talks about customer as assets. These are like investments, you know, you, you, you invest to acquire them and you invest to you know, and the, and the fruits are in retentions and opportunity for cross-selling and upselling. So these are the two dimensions that I'd like to focus on. So the first one is creating value. So customer centricity, one part of it is yes, the customer friendliness, right? For example, Rhys Carlton, uh, you know, uh, brags about uh, creating delightful experiences for their customers, right? 
for example, suppose you visited Ritz Carlton one time, you know, in the past, and you requested a pillow. So the next time you visit the hotel again, the pillow will be in your room waiting for you. So you don't need to ask for it again. Or suppose you requested, you know, soft, some soft drink like uh, Seven Up in your past trip, your past visit to the, to, to the hotel, and the first thing they, they do to kind of welcome you is to give you the same drink. Uh, they have also a slogan where the employee owns the problem, meaning suppose some light went off and uh, you, you don't know whom to call, you know, you just call any number or you can talk to any employee and the employee would, would respond, uh, would basically own the problem and solve it for you. You don't need to go through you know, know a series of steps. So that's about value creation. The other part here is about value capture. capture. To be sustainable you need to create and capture value. So it's like give love to the customer and get love back. It is about a win-win relationship. You change the life of the customer, you make them happy, but at the same time you also make yourself happy to sustain your long-term activities. So that's kind of uh, the the you know what the definition of customer centricity, which is at the intersection of creating and capturing value. You have to really work on both. You have to work on that creating that win-win relationship. I think Bruce Allen said it in a, a beautiful way. Customer-centric firm understand not only what the customer values, but also the value the customer represents to their bottom line. You need to really, you know, succeed in this interface in creating value and capturing it from the right customers. Let me give you some examples for firms who did it very well, for firms that are mostly about value creation and for firms that are mostly about capturing value. My first example is about this insurance company called Progressive this company enter the insurance market. This market is very, very competitive because customers are very price sensitive. Uh, why they are sensitive? Because the cost uh, of insurance per year is around at least $1,000 per car. So if you have like three cars that you are owning, you have to pay $3,000 a year. So it's a big expense. And if it is a big expense, people tend to search around to find the cheapest uh, option. And because it's very competitive, the industry is not profitable. And if any company is making any money, it is thanks to the investment that they do on the prepaid premium. If I spend $1,000 to, let's say, progressive, progressive, use that money to invest it in the stock market or in other places. So if the company is making money, is thanks to the prepaid premium. Now this company Progressive entered that market and they wanted to create value to their customer and they introduced this new service called uh, immediate response vans. These vans are basically if an accident happened, God forbids, you have to call the, the uh, Progressive and the IRV will come immediately. Sometimes they arrive at the accident scene much faster than the police. So clearly they created some value, some, they showed some benevolence, they showed some care to their customers. And the question is, you know, how can they make money in a very competitive market? How do they capture that value? So they created value, but how do they capture it? The company is very clever. One of the, the uh, the uh, characteristics of this industry is that they suffer from frauds and legal fees. Actually, for every dollar the company makes, 15 cents would go to, you know, to legal fees and fighting frauds. So the cost of the IRVs is, you know, is much, much cheaper than the cost of frauds. So in some way, the IRVs are a way to reduce fraud. So you may be calling them fraud busters. 
The other thing also by having IRVs, you are creating what we call in marketing self-selection in the sense that if I'm a, a customer that I cheat insurance companies, if I know that Progressive has IRVs, therefore I cannot cheat, and therefore I sway, I'm swayed away from it, I, so therefore I, I won't uh, buy insurance from them. So just having the IRVs, you know, would shy away those, uh, you know, uh, fraudulent customers, those bad customers, right? And the company would work with honest customers. So that's one thing that they did to, to capture value. The other thing they did is by selecting their own customers, right? So uh, in this case, they came up, they introduced the notion of comparison quotes. When you call them about, uh, you know, a quote about the price they would charge you uh, for insurance, they not only give you the quote for progressive, they'll give you also the quote for progressive and other competitors. Some of them, sometimes progressive is cheaper, sometimes they are more expensive than competitors. Why is this? Because progressive does its homework. They study the risk profile of its of the driver. If the driver is a risky driver, then they most likely will be losing money from him, and therefore they give him a higher quote. But uh, if the driver the driver is not risky at all, is in good standing, did not get ticket in the past then they'll charge the driver much less money. So by this comparison quotes, by this driver risk assessment, they're attracting the most, the less risky customers and therefore the most profitable customers. And they're of course sending the more risky customers to back to the competition to deal with them. You may be asking, why didn't the competition do that? Also, yes, actually, after Progressive, you know, many competitors uh, followed suit and they started to also, you know, uh, you know, assess the customer risk level. However, Progressive kept, you know, moving on faster and doing finer and finer segmentation of their customer base. So they are always ahead of the game as compared to the other ones. Just an example. If uh, two senior citizens, right, were got tickets, one is got a ticket for failure to yield, right, and the other one is for for speeding in the highway. Progressive treat these customers differently. Actually, they penalize the customer, the senior citizen, who failed to yield much more than the customer who is speeding up. The idea is that the, the senior citizen, the old man who is speeding up, is a man who is still young at heart, he's still speeding, he's still active in life. The other one who failed to yield is, is starting to lose it, and therefore they treat them differently. So that's an example of a company that to really try to play a good balance between value creation and value capturing. And it really supports the point that uh, Booz Allen mentioned, that customer-centric firms know not only what the customer value, in this case the IRV, but also the value the customer represents to their bottom line. By understanding the risk of the, uh, of the driver, they could compute the exact, the exact profitability and the impact on their bottom line. So this is a good company that has balance between value capture and value creation. Let's look at uh, a company that has focused mostly on creating value without regard to value capture. This company is Hoover in 1993. The story goes, at that time, uh, this company has run a promotion which say that if you buy $500 worth 
of Hoover products, right, from the company, then you are entitled for uh, two free air tickets to the U.S. This is a very generous promotion to the point that 200,000 customers took advantage of it. They called in and took advantage of it. And the, the whole promotion resulted in a, a hundred million dollar loss to the, to the company and, uh, and uh, resulted also in many senior executives being fired. Clearly, this promotion is very generous. Clearly, it created value to the customer, but it clearly destroyed value to the, the firm, right? Um, now, you may argue that actually it may have created value in the long run. That's a very important point. In that case, it is the onus on the marketing department or whoever is promoting this product or running this promotion to show what is the impact of this promotion. If you don't have a good argument for it, if you don't have a good metric of profitability in the long run or short term, then people may interpret it as a waste of money. So that's kind of an example of a company that really paid more attention to value creation to the customer without regard to value capture. capture. Uh, more generally, you know, let me talk a little bit about promotions. Uh, there is a company called Groupon. Uh, I'm sure that uh, many of you know about this company. Groupon is uh, basically runs weekly promotions. Uh, they go to restaurants, spas, gyms, theater, and uh, they tell them, look, uh, you know, you can use our coupons or Groupons, as they call them to attract new customers, right? And they go to their customers, the guys who uh, redeem group coupons or Groupons, and they tell them, you know, if you, you know, you'll never have to pay full price for services or for products. This is how the model works. So, Suppose you are a restaurant owner, Groupon comes to you and said, let's run a promotion for you, a Groupon promotion for you. Basically, you are expected to give a 50% discount to, you, to my customers. So if the meal costs $100, the customer will pay $50. Out of the $50 that the customer pays, Groupon takes $25, and the other $25 would go to, to the restaurant. Effectively, the restaurant is running a 75% off promotion. It is a very, very deep promotion. So the graph that you see in front of you is uh, from some research that is published uh, in 2011 by buyers uh, and colleagues, trying to see the impact of these Groupon promotions. On the x-axis, you see, you know, in the middle, the Groupon offer. Of course, this is aggregated over many promotions, but imagine for now, this is just for one restaurant or one spa, for example. So that's the week where they offer the promotion. Then uh, they observe, they measure six months prior and six months after, they measure the number of reviews that uh, people write about the restaurant or the spa or the gym. So on the right side, you can say average number of reviews. You can see that y-axis there. And what they're finding is just to look on the, on the right side of the axis is that uh, this group one promotion do indeed, you know, lead to higher number of reviews by customers, right? You can see that, uh, you know, the graphs, the, uh, the histogram tend to increase on the right side. So that's a good news. It's saying that people go to the restaurant and uh, write about it. That's good. They could also attribute 
the, the increase in the reviews to the Groupon use. If you look at the dark bars on the right side, you know, those are the reviews that they noted, which noted Groupon in the review. So you could say that the increase in the reviews stems from the, from, uh, the Groupon use. So that's kind of uh, the fact that they established. Of course, they got this data by crawling the internet. Now the question, the, the problem that they faced was they don't really know whether people are saying good things about the restaurant or the spa or the gym, or they are bad, saying bad things. So um, the only thing that they could track was something called Yelp rating, which is on the on the left y-axis, and these ratings are made by people uh, about restaurant and other services, and what they are finding overall that the Yelp ratings are declining. They went down by half a point. Right? Just to give you an idea about the meaning of a decline by half a point, they refer to another study that showed that uh, an incre a, a, a reduction or a decrease in Yelp rating by one point typically leads to a 9% decrease in revenue for the restaurant or, this, or the service provider which means that the Yelp rating actually led to a 4.5% decrease in revenues on average. All right. Uh, you may think that Groupon are users. I, I don't want you to take uh, that conclusion because it may work for some and it may not work for others. Um, and uh, I suggest that you test them and see the impact on business is this effect negative. One of the reasons is that by running this heavy deep promotion you may be attracting more customer than you can digest. Right? Um, so if it is a restaurant maybe you know many people would come in and the service would deteriorate and uh, people would become unhappy. That's one possibility. Actually, there is an example from England where um, uh, a bakery ran this kind of promotion and typically they were selling like 100 to 200 cupcakes a day. That day they had to face 8,000 cupcakes purchases and the whole bakery was not equipped to produce that uh, quantity and that led to a huge loss for the bakery and they had to hire camps to just satisfy that demand. So that's one one reason. The other reason is that uh, sometimes when you come when you come in to the restaurant you may need to declare that you have a group on and the moment you declare you have to have a group on you know the restaurant or the spa may give you a lower level service because it's a cheap one and that would create some dissatisfaction. Actually there is a website called uh, uh, one eight hundred flower. This this website uh, basically deliver flowers over the internet, and they run this promotion. And uh, when people have Groupon, they are uh, ordered. They are asked to count, to go to a specific dedicated website. And on that website, uh, people were not shown the regular, you know, set of uh, flowers, but they were shown them the more expensive ones, right? So in some way they are cheating the customer and the 1-800 flowers got into trouble because of that. So these are some of the reasons why Yelp rating uh, may go down. But the main reasons for me is that these Groupons are attracting the wrong customers. In marketing, we call them the cherry pickers. The people who run from promotion to promotions. They are looking for discount after discounts. So the reason they, that brings them to you, right, is the same reason to take them to the competition. So that's, uh, so those customers not tend to be not loyal, they just go from customer 
from company to company. So that's uh, one of the main reasons here. The other reasons here is about promotion in general. You know, when people buy on promotion, they typically attribute their satisfaction not to the restaurant, not to the brand, but to the deal or the discount that they got. They get happy because of that. But they won't have a respect for the brand and things like that. So promotion tend to hurt the brand overall, over, the, over time. So again, between Hoover and Groupon, I, I just try to tell you about a situation where, you know, sometime we create value to the company, to the consumer, without regard to value creation to the company. Let's look at a situation where companies have focused more on, on value capture without regard to value creation. Uh, my wife, uh, one time she went to a store and she paid my credit card and the store clerk asked her or told her that uh, you, could, you could receive uh, many, many free magazines. So without telling her the details, so she was tempted, oh why not, since it's free, why not, right? So she signed up for probably 10 of them, right? So, uh, you know, we, we are receiving these 10 magazines like sometime weekly, at the weekly level, sometime monthly level. Uh, you know, my wife probably reads one or two, uh, but uh, they kept piling, you know, of in our house and creating a mess. You just see them as a waste of paper. And uh, even for free, I told my wife, why are you subscribing? You know, uh, you don't need them. But I was surprised, like three months after, and I see, you know, credit card billing from these magazines, from different companies, where I have to pay tons of bills. So uh, it was a sad story because uh, I get the billing. I don't even have the 800 number or the toll-free number to call. Uh, I don't have an email address. It was very frustrating experience to chase these people. So I had to call the credit card company and try to stop uh, these payments. Uh, it was uh, I wasted almost a day of my life trying to chase this company. So uh, it's a situation where these people are trying to just grab customers, whether they are you know, good customer, whether they are loyal customer or not, just sell for the sake of uh, selling. So that's an example of uh, a company that trying to focus on mostly caption value. Another example of a company that focus more on caption value is uh, the cell phone industry. I have two examples here. Uh, one time my, my son lost his uh, cell phone and uh, you know I think the contract is going to end after two months or so, so I, and he was going on vacation so I thought we don't, he does not need the phone, I can wait till the time of uh, contract renewal. And he's young enough to the point that he really does not need a phone. So, uh, but I alerted the uh, T-Mobile then uh, about the problem. So, uh, then after one month or so, while he was on vacation, somehow I just tried to call his number to see maybe the person who stole it or found it, maybe he could return it. So I, I was just uh, still wishful uh, that some, something can happen. But I was surprised when I called, you know, some Turkish guy responded and he told me, this is my phone number, you know, this is not your son's phone number. I got it recently from T-Mobile. So what happened is T-Mobile basically changed the number without even calling me and letting me know. And then when I went back to check the bill, I was penalized for $200. So not only they stole the number, not only they, they charged me $200 without alerting me. I was so mad, right? This company doesn't care. Just grab the money regardless. Of course, you know, if you go back to the contract, maybe they have something that says in fine print that uh, uh, if uh, the account is not being used, you have to pay a penalty. The point here, I'm paying the monthly bill, so why are you penalizing me, right? So again, there is no customer orientation. It's just uh, a doggy dog kind of uh, experience. Um, again, for the cell phone industry, uh, they have what we call in the U.S. a three-part tariff, meaning that uh, you buy a monthly plan, uh, you know, it's like a contract for two years, 
every month we have to pay, let's say, $50. The $50 would entitle you to, let's say, 500 minutes for free. And any minutes that you would consume or would call after the 500 minutes, you would be penalized by a high cost. It's probably 40 cents a minute or so. So in this case, the company has put itself in, in, a, in a very good position. They always benefit. If you are under the usage allowance, under the 500 minutes, right, they are benefiting because the consumer is not using their network. If you are using more than the 500 usage allowance, then you have to pay a penalty. So this situation where the company benefits when the customer loses. And whenever you have that situation, the industry is opening its doors to new entrants. It's a very bad strategy. So this is an example of companies that are more about how to, you know, uh, screw the customer than about how to create a win-win relationship. So it's an example of, of uh, companies that create what we call adversaries as opposed to advocates. It's important here to know that you should have few adversaries than advocates because an unhappy customer would talk to probably 10 people. A happy customer is at best will talk to two to three people, right? So you need to minimize these adversaries. Actually, as an example for this is, uh, I'm sure you heard about this one, is this, uh, uh, this new song called uh, United Airlines Broke My Guitar. So this guy, he put his guitar in, you know, as part of the baggage, and when he received it at the airport, he found it broken, so he complained to United, and United didn't admit their mistake, and they told him to go away. So the guy wrote a song, and that entitled United Broke My Guitar, and today I went back to the website, uh, you know, to YouTube, and I found that the song had 13, 13 million downloads, just to tell you, you know, uh, what kind of PR, negative PR it has created to United. Uh, actually, there is a nice metric uh, that company use, uh, you know, to measure the health of the business, and this metric is called And the way he measures this concept is by question to customers in surveys. The question is simple. How likely would you recommend our company or our brand to others? The, the scale is from 1 to 5, where 1 is definitely not, 5 definitely yes. So he simply takes the percent of the customer or the respondent to say definitely yes, minus the percent of the people definitely no, and he calls that the net promoter score. So uh, you want to make sure that you have more promoters, more advocates than adversaries. So that's a metric that you could track over time. That's a metric that you could compare, uh, you know, uh, across uh, competition and to assess the health of the benefits, especially in the long run. In some way, it is like a leading indicator. So just to summarize the first part, what we did so far is uh, customer, we defined what customer centricity means. It is about this dual value creation. It is about creating a win-win relationship, creating value to the customer and capturing value from the customer in a situation where the customer, both the customer and the firm benefit. That's kind of the main idea. We talked about a company that did it well. There are companies that focus more on customer value creation and there are some other more on you know value capturing.
Right. I'm sure there are tons of other examples that we could talk about, uh, uh, but these are just uh, to illustrate these notions. Uh, now the question is how to create value, and um, I uh, I try to kind of uh, structure the discussion here around uh, uh, you know something called the Kano chart. Kano is a Japanese marketer, and he came up with uh, three kind of uh, needs: dissatisfiers, satisfiers, and delighters. In this graph, there is the x-axis, you know, reflect performance. You know, as perceived by the by the by the uh, by the customer, and the y-axis is how satisfied is the customer, right? So let's look at uh, dissatisfiers. So these are uh, things uh, that uh, people are even if you do well, even if we tell you that people did extremely well on them, they are okay. They are neutral on satisfaction. Right? It, it won't make them happy, it won't make them satisfied, even if you perfect on them. However, if you perform really badly on them, right, then people become very, very dissatisfied. So, um, so these are things that people expect, right? And uh, because they expect them, because you promise them to deliver, if you deliver them, they are fine, no big deal, but if you don't deliver them, they become very, very upset. Right? One source of knowledge uh, of these tech satisfiers is the customer complaint box. If people complain about something, because they complain because you promised them something and you didn't do it. So, in order to identify these dissatisfiers, you know, you may need to have some, you know, complaint box or some website for people to, to, you know, to kind of express their complaints and their dissatisfaction. And if you have anything to fix in the short term, you have to focus on these dissatisfiers. The extreme side is what we call the lighters. These are things that you didn't promise people about. These are things that even if you don't have them, if the performance is extremely bad, right, uh, you know it's okay, but the moment you deliver them, the moment you per, you show some performance in them, people get excited, people get surprised, people get delighted. So these are uh, you know things that people don't expect. These are you know hidden needs. These are things that uh, these are surprises that delight your customers, right? Uh, Satisfiers are things that people are familiar with, and the more you deliver on them, the higher the performance, the higher satisfaction. For a laptop computer, for example, you know, the lighter it is, the better. The more performant it is, the better. The more CPU, the better. That's the uh, what we call satisfiers. And of course, over the life cycle of the product, you know, of a product, the lighter becomes satisfiers, and satisfiers become dissatisfiers, and that is the circle of innovation. So. Uh, Let's talk about some examples to understand, you know, people' expectation or spoken needs, right? Uh, and then later on, something, some, to in, how to infer unspoken needs, and let's talk about uh, satisfier as well. All right. So uh, this is an example from uh, Starbucks uh, to listen to their customers uh, to. Uh, to kind of uh, include their voice within the company, they created uh, some idea website where people can come in and uh, you know suggest ideas for products, for services, for experience, and for community involvement. Uh, you know, and uh, uh, people uh, once people suggest the idea, uh, the members of the community would vote on them and the successful ideas get uh, discussed by the company uh, you know uh, marketing department so uh, you know and the result of the discussion is they come back and say these are the idea that uh, we launched these are the idea that we are currently reviewing. So in some way, you know, you need to reward people for their suggestion. Just if you get just the idea and run away, 
people don't see the reward from from their effort and they'll they'll give up so it's very important that uh, you tell them what you are doing uh, another thing is, uh, this is uh, an airline uh, and uh, JetBlue's and somehow their way of listening for the customer is to encourage people to say stories uh, uh, on their website through videos or text or picture just to describe you know, what made them happy and what made them unhappy. Uh, the company studied this to, to see, you know, to learn from it. Do what's good and uh, avoid what's bad and uh, one time I heard this customer he was uh, talking about his story at some time he was flying from San Francisco to to New York and the flight was full and the company asked if there are some people who would like to take uh, a two-leg kind of flight going uh, to from uh, from San Francisco to Houston and from Houston to to, to New York, so he he volunteered, uh, you know, and one of his reasons was that he enjoys the movies, he enjoyed the service, and the service that he mentioned was that uh, somehow he slept, he dozed off in the flight, and uh, the moment he woke up, the flight attendant came in and gave him his food. She told him that we came earlier, but uh, we were flight, we didn't want to disturb you. Now that you woke up, here it is. That, that was uh, a delightful experience, uh, something that was unexpected, and uh, it, uh, it, was, uh, it was memorable for him. Uh, the other example is sometimes, you know, listening to the customer has its limit. Uh, and you may want to, you know, run experiments. You might want to test, or you might want to do something else. The example that I'm going to talk about is Intuit, and uh, Intuit provides accounting software and uh, tax software. In the U.S., uh, you can buy a software to, you know, to report your taxes. So uh, instead of going to a tax accountant, you buy the software and you have to fill in your information uh, on it. So uh, the company knows very well that if the software is messy, if the software is complex, then no way people will use it. So they, ha they live by ease of use. The slogan there for the company is you make a software that your mother or grandmother can use. So what they do typically, they they uh, before they launch it, they uh, ask their engineers uh, to go. They provide them with some tax information for a household or a company. They give them the information. They ask them to go ahead and buy TurboTax and fill the information themselves. So basically, trying to push them to be in the shoe of the customer to see where the difficulties are. Uh, so that's one thing they do and they do a lot of beta testing uh, using their employees just to make sure that there are no software glitches. But in spite of this, nothing is perfect uh, because uh, you know, mistakes can happen. And the way they you know, uh, fix mistakes is by simply uh, you know, asking their engineers to respond to uh, their customer complaints. Or if a customer reports a glitch in the software or some ambiguity, then it is the task of the engineer to solve the problem immediately, right? Because if you don't solve it, many others will call and it will cost the company much more. So, uh, so that's kind of uh, the idea there was that uh, they have the slogan of do it right the second time. Mistakes can happen. Avoid them as much as you can, but if they happen, learn from it, fix it as soon as possible. Don't make it twice. Right? The, uh, the part that I introduced there uh, in, the, in the slide is that uh, the software costs around $45, right? Uh, it's very cheap. And they don't hide their toll-free numbers, right? You, you see it everywhere in the package. Actually, they encourage you to call if you have any problem or anything. So, uh, and the idea there is like they're trying to use the customer themselves to identify glitches, uh, problems, so they, they fix them 
uh, as uh, as early as possible. So that's uh, in some way to avoid further mistakes and further escalation. Recently, they introduced another service, which is uh, uh, if the customer have you know tax questions, you know not software questions, then they could call a live type tax advisor to answer their questions. So. Uh, uh, this is a very expensive proposition, right? Uh, the cost of a tax advisor is around dollars a year, so it's very expensive, uh, uh, you know, proposition. And why are they doing this? Uh, part of it is that uh, one of the barrier to adoption is not just the use of software uh, at this stage, because they want to grow. One of the barrier is people tend to be novice about taxes and they would rather go to to do it to their taxes face to face in front of an accountant so one way to alleviate this barrier to adoption is by introducing this uh, live tax advisors and the reasoning here is that yes i may lose some money from you right now but if you get hooked to the software then you become a long term customer especially with this tax software there is what we call switching costs at the moment you get familiar with them, the moment you introduce your demographic information, your tax information, right? It's hard to switch away to the competition because there's a cost of switching, right? Uh, you know, when you file taxes, not you not only have to change your address, you have to write your address again, your social security number, uh, number, and your personal information. You have also to take into account past information like depreciation and other things. So, uh, you know, the idea here is that they're viewing the customer as long-term assets. You invest in acquiring them right now, but you reap the fruits in long-term retention and long-term cross-selling for other products. Uh, so that's another example uh, for a company that tried to listen and uh, test and learn. The third one, sometimes people cannot articulate what they want and what they need. Uh, you, even if you ask them, they won't tell you anything. And my favorite example is about this uh, Honda Odyssey. Many vans, uh, early 97, 98, you know, they used to come with three rows of seats, right? The, the beauty of them is that they can carry many people. And they give you the option to carry, you know, to move things. So by re removing the back seat from the car, you can use it as, you know, uh, for moving purposes. So I bought one of those minivans in the beginning, and it is a headache uh, whenever I need to move things. Uh, whenever my wife goes to travel overseas, I have to, she takes a lot of suitcases and they have to re remove the packs. So it's a very painful experience. And if Honda asks me what, what uh, if I'm happy, I'll say I'm happy, of course, but I will never be able to tell them that I'm suffering from this backseat problem. However, their research we're observing, and they came with a solution of the problem. The solution was, you know, to avoid this uh, issue, you just press a button and the back seat will fall in and all that space is yours with no headache. Right? I assure you that if you do focus groups, interviews, none of the ideas, none of this complaint will emerge. Only by observing did Honda you know, unearth an, a, a, a hidden, a latent need that surprised the customer afterwards. The moment they announced that uh, innovation, you know, you have to see, you know, the, uh, the, the, well, they had like a backlog of six months, people waiting eagerly to buy this, uh, this thing, uh, this uh, new minivan, and see how much price they charge for the minivan. This is by simply observing, right, and trying to find solution to people problems that they could not articulate. Uh, Sometimes the experience, sometimes the, the experience or the quality of the service does not depend on you as a service provider, it depends on other customers. So the example here is Zipcar. Zipcar here is basically, they rent cars by the hour or two hours for short term period. These cars are parked in parking lots you know, throughout the city. They are very convenient. If you live in a neighborhood and there's a parking lot, the chances are that you could, you know, rent a car within uh, short distance and per hour or two. 
So uh, it's a nice kind of uh, system. You have to make your reservation online, and uh, it is done by membership. So it's very convenient. Now the problem is that they faced early on was that, that um, you know if there are two people you know uh, for example Muhammad rented it from four to six and Ali you know rented the car from six to eight you know what the, you know, the problem is suppose that Muhammad came late you know how would uh, Ali feel right uh, I, I think you must agree with me that Ali would be very pissed especially if he's renting a car for something very important. So what to do here, right? Uh, and there are many options that uh, one could discuss. Uh, it could be that uh, Zipcar could have uh, many cars in the parking lot, so that if one car, uh, you know, is not available, I, the customer would use another one. Uh, but remember, this is a startup, and they cannot afford to uh, have uh, large inventory. The other one is could be that uh, you should leave some time between you know, two rentals so that you allow for mistakes. That's fine also, but that may cut into the profitability of the firm. Remember, it's a startup. Uh, the third one could be that uh, you, sh you know, Ali and Muhammad could share their contact information and uh, Muhammad should alert Ali if he's late or something like that so that he can solve his problem. So there are tons of, or the last one is uh, maybe uh, providing uh, a penalty, right? Uh, if uh, Muhammad comes late, then give him a penalty for uh, you, you know, uh, for coming late. So all of these are possible solutions to this problem. Let me give you an example here, just to hint to where what the Zipcar did then. And uh, this is an experiment that was done uh, among uh, uh, ten. Uh, daycare centers in the US. The daycare center problem was that parents come late to pick up their kids at the end of the day. You know, the last hour for the daycare is 4, 4, 4 o'clock, 4 p.m. But some people, some parents come later. And that creates some anxiety for the kid and anxiety for the, for the teachers. And the question is what to do with it. So they hired an economist, and the economist uh, solution was to charge a penalty, right? Uh, you know, if people come late, charge them, let's say, a $10 penalty. That's the solution. And before launching this uh, program, they ran an experiment that lasted 20 weeks. So for the first five weeks, they did nothing. They, like, this is like the old system. This is like a, what you call a control period. And the, uh, at that time, they measured the lateness, and they found that on average there were eight lateness per daycare per day, right? So that's the the metric before you know without doing nothing. During the experimental period, they what they did they uh, you know uh, you know they charged a penalty of ten dollars if the parents come late. And uh, this ran from week five to week 15, and they, what they found was that the lateness actually has more than doubled. It became 20 per day on average. From week five to week 15, to 20, that is the last five weeks, they said, okay, let's remove the penalty because it doesn't seem to be working, and let's go back to the old system. What happened, to their surprise, was that the, the lateness has not decreased. You would, you would expect it to go back to five, but actually no, right? It stayed at 20. Why all this happening? Somehow you train your customer, right, to kind of, you give them license to come late. You put a price on something that was morally wrong, right, and you put a price of $10, which is nothing. You priced a priceless thing, right, a moral obligation, toward the kid and toward the school and toward the teacher for ten dollars. So now people got used to that. They said, well, you know, if you know during the experimental period, yeah, ten dollars nothing, I could stay in my office and do extra work. It's worth it. Right? Uh, and after the period people learned that uh, you know this uh, lateness is not an issue for the daycare center. Uh, it's not a big deal. I think I could afford to come late. So this is kind of the experiment here is sometimes moral 
incentives are much more powerful than economic incentives. So based on these insights, right, Zipcar kind of decided not to give late fees. Uh, they basically kept, you know, educated their customer that it's morally wrong to do this. And they asked their customer, you know, they asked Ali, for example, to rate Muhammad if he comes late. So Muhammad now is, a, is accountable towards Ali. He's not going to hurt the company, he's going to hurt Ali. And uh, people tend to be much more conscious when they hurt fellow customers than when they hurt the company. And uh, as a result, you know, the company has faced much reduced lateness. So this is uh, another example where what to do when the experience of one customer uh, affects the experience of another. All right, uh, to, uh, to we are uh, reaching the third uh, element of the lecture. I don't know how I'm doing on, on time, uh, uh, Dr. but uh, yeah, sorry to please. sorry to interrupt. Yeah, <laughs> but yes, yes um, uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, maybe we can take another five minutes to finish it up because then we okay. have some time for Q and A in the end. Okay, that's fine. Sorry, I think I I I uh, I, uh, I was not looking at the clock. Okay. Um, no. All right, because I'm looking at the screen and uh, without uh, uh, I can uh, seeing the clock on the computer. Okay. Go ahead and so le le briefly, let me just say here. Uh, this is a study by uh, Frederick Reichheld uh, called the Law the Loyalty Effect, and this is a great study that shows the reward from customer authenticity. Right. Uh, let me just uh, say a few points very quickly here. Uh, you know, for the credit card industry, this uh, this graph here, uh, you know, uh, the cost of acquisition is eighty dollars. That's the investment to acquire new customers, and then, uh, but if you look at the return, the profit, uh, you know, you, you get forty dollars from the uh, the first year, sixty six uh, the third, second, and seventy two the third year. The point here is is really pushes the view that customer as assets, and uh, you know, uh, and the value is more in the long run than the short term. In this case, for the company to be profitable, you have to keep the customer at least for two years. That's uh, one key point. The uh, and most companies tend to care about acquiring and getting new customer without regard to retention. So this is point number one. Point number two: if you look at the industrial distribution, uh, somehow the cost of acquisition is free, uh, which is fine. But look at the reward from a first-year customer, which is $45 a year, and the reward from a uh, five-year customer, which is 168 The idea here is that if you lose a five-year customer, you have to ask yourself by how many customer, new customers you have to replace that customer in order to maintain your profitability. I think the graph is clear here is that if you lose a five-year customer, you need to replace them by uh, at least four of them to maintain your profitability. The point again, there is a lot of value from your uh, from your uh, old customers. Uh, why is that? Uh, because uh, old customers, uh, you know, they tend to be loyal, uh, uh, and you don't need to acquire new ones. Uh, the uh, they buy other stuff through cross-selling and upselling. They tend to be cheaper to 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 serve, and they refer other customer to you. And sometimes they even willing to pay higher prices for you. Uh, so uh, this concept of centricity is probably simple, but actually it's very, very tough to implement. I want to say a few things here. Uh, you need to have the right environment uh, to, for it to succeed. You have to have leadership that buys into the customer, that are passionate about the customer, that they dream with the customer, and they talk only about the customers. Like for MBNA as a bank, for example, whenever they send a check, they say, tell their employees, brought to you by the customer. You also need to, this leadership has to inspire the culture. The, customer, the culture has to, you know, see the value from the customers. They, they should know that without the customer, there is no future for the company. Uh, the employees also have to be empowered, you know, talk about external marketing and internal marketing you know without we cannot do marketing if you cannot if your employees are not on board uh, so Walmart for example they they do weekly seminars where all their marketing and employees are participate where they're sharing good customer stories to inspire other managers to kind of follow suit so uh, you need to have 
a culture that believes in the customer. Employees need to be empowered. They need to be on board because they are the customer-facing people. And an example of this was uh, I went to renew my cell phone uh, service, and the guy, after doing his service, he said, "Could you go back to Could you go back to the website and give me a rating of 10 out of uh, 10 point scale?" You know, you can see here. This, this company does not mean customer centricity. They just mean, you know, they, they say that we need to have customer centricity, let's have it. So they're just after the, the number, they're not really after doing something good. Uh, compare this to another situation where I was coming back from Hong Kong to, to New York and I was taking a Continental Airlines and the flight attendant uh, said that this is the last flight under the Continental name, I guess Continental and United merged then, and it, the company would be called United from now on. And uh, she boasted about how well the company treated her, uh, you know, uh, uh, how happy she was, and she starts crying at the same time. You know, uh, this is coming from the heart. This means that the company really cares about its employees and its customers. There I cannot see a gap between what senior management think and what employees think. It is nicely lined up. The other part of the story is the structure should be lined up around the customer. You should be organized around customer or market segments. And you need to have the infrastructure for data collections. Without data, you can't learn about the customer. You cannot share it across. And you cannot really make wise segmentation and marketing program decisions. So uh, the inner part of the building blocks is you have to have a sound strategy. You have to have a brand. But like for example, Tesco, they have a slogan called uh, every little helps. And anything that, that they do, you know, show customers that they are, they are on the side of the customer. They are helping the customer. They also say that it is our job to earn the customer loyalty. Right? And uh, behind that uh, brand, which kind of uh, the, the, how people think about you, right? Uh, there is a strategy around segmentation, the determining what are the different segments of the market, which segment should we go after, uh, and how should we differentiate ourselves uh, with the competition. And the strategy gives you kind of uh, an idea of where you are heading, uh, but uh, you need to know how to get there. For that, you need marketing programs that are based on on data, on information, like pricing, products, services, and things like that. And most importantly, you have to have a metric. The only thing I have to say about metric, these days there is a move from simple market share models, uh, metrics, to what we call share of wallet measures. Right? Uh, I I the view is, you know, uh, what do my customer need, and do I have the product that uh, they need? So, uh, away from the view of how can I sell one product. Just to summarize, I know I took a lot of time. Uh, there is a move from a product-centric to a customer-centric view. And uh, the unit of analysis in the past is a product. Now it is a customer. And the question is, you know, what do my customer want? And do I have the product and service that they need? Right? Uh, a company like GE, they, uh, they don't really look at the product only. They look at the customer. They study their context and try to see, you know, what do their client want, you know, what are their, and they want to come up with a one-stop shopping for their, all their needs. And sometimes they, they don't, just don't push their product, they push, sometimes they sell them solution provided by the competition. So it's become like a one-stop shopping that, uh, that is around what customer need. Uh, so the view is moving from maximizing share, market share, to maximizing the customer lifetime value, maximizing the share of wallet. Your customer are assets in the past, they were your products. The organization is structured around uh, uh, the customer segments away from just uh, brand management or product management. So that's what I have to say uh, in, in this uh, introduction to customer centricity. Uh, we can now open to a question if you may have. And I'm sorry for taking no, more time. No, not at all. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Jadidi. Uh Folks, if you have questions, uh, you could either post your questions in the chat box or you raise your hand. There's a hand icon uh, available on your webinar console. So if you can raise your hand, I will be able to give you um, an opportunity to speak to the doctor and ask your question. Um, I see there is a hand already raised, so let me go and try to mute. Uh, Mr. Vajahat, uh, you've raised your hand. Could you please introduce yourself and ask your question? 
Mr. Abdullah Hello, Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, I can. Yeah. So this is uh, Abdullah Wajahat, uh, uh, based on San Francisco. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for providing the complete 360 view of the customer and what the customer satisfaction and acquisition means. Uh, uh, my question is, uh, are we comparing apples to apple when we say customer such as the group of services versus the product? What's the difference between because one, you say, yeah, it's, it's a service industry, Groupon or anybody who provides a service through social media or anything versus a product which is they sell the product to them. Both are end of the day product, but what is the level of customer satisfaction and centricity when it comes to service versus product? Thank you, Abdullah. I'm, uh, uh, you know, let me just uh, make the distinction. Um, I was talking uh, earlier not from the perspective of Groupon, uh, but from the perspective of a service provider or a product provider. Uh, I'm speaking from the perspective of a restaurant or, uh, let's say, uh, a spa, you know, or a gym provider. Uh, for Groupon, uh, really, uh, they are uh, on the win-win side. You know, they, you know. They are, their incentive is to sell as many Groupon as possible, regardless of the impact of that promotion. Uh, I believe, I don't think their business model is going to be sustainable in the long run, unless they try to find that uh, balance that, uh, uh, you know, that, uh, that win-win intersection uh, between value creation and value capture. I go, I go back to the Booz Allen statement. Uh, in the sense that customer-centric firm understand not only what the customer value, but also the value the customer represents to them. In, in this situation, they are, you know, they are clearly they are making money, right? Regardless whether they are creating value to their to the spa or to the restaurant or to the gym uh, services, right? Uh, in the long run, I think because of competition, uh, also because of uh, uh, some company may realize that these are useless effort, uh, uh, and they will stop doing it. And then uh, I, I predict that Groupon would move to a model where they do this Groupon not to, they don't send this Groupon to everybody, they'll be sending them to, to targeted people, people who are very likely to be long-term customers, uh, as opposed to be cherry pickers. So if you look at it from the perspective of Groupon, and if I'm consulting Groupon, I would uh, really tell them to pay attention to this, because for now they are simply, in my mind, they are, you know, they're Standing group on to group on to group on for everybody, and in some extent they are ripping off the their clients. Uh, uh, I think uh, they need to be worried about the value, extent of value creation to their clients. Right? The other side also, if I am uh, using, if I'm a company, suppose I'm a restaurant owner, I have to be wary about whether this group on are helping me create customer in the long run or not. Because if it is just a promotion bringing cherry pickers, then and this promotion are hurting my uh, reputation, then I should stop them. So my suggestion would be that uh, it, it depends on what perspective. Of course, you should take the perspective of uh, a comp your company trying to use Groupon. So I would experiment with them, try to see you know whether what is the impact of this Groupon in in the long run. Are they bringing me new customers? Uh, are these customers staying for the long run or not? Because if they're not staying, then it's Totally, totally uh, use this. Yeah. I, I, I don't know whether I answered the question, but this is kind of my best. Interpretation. Yeah, I think I, I think you did. I think you did. So, 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 so the more like uh, to me, this group on type of is a different business model. Those who have more customers, who acquired more customers, they can use their as an asset to go and and market their their services. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Thank you, Abdullah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Abdullah. Uh, let's move to uh, the chat box. Uh, we have a question uh, from Brother Muad Akili. Um, the question is: Insurance industry has a different nature. Realizing that most of the customers looking for policy prices and the value for the for their booklet uh, for their booklet. How can we apply a customer centricity concept to such an aggressive industry? Uh, uh, to, to, to such an aggressive uh, uh, 
uh, industry, right? Uh, insurance, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, actually, the uh, example uh, is actually uh, that I mentioned there is in spite that people are com purely price sensitive. Uh, you know, again, it's a big expense, and people would go for the cheapest thing. I think what Progressive did, they did two things. They looked at the cost structure and identified a big chunk of it coming from fraud and legal fees. As I mentioned earlier, for every dollar that uh, of revenue, 15 cents would go to fraud and legal fees. So a solution for that is to introduce these IRVs, immediate response vans. And this, the cost of these IRVs is much, much cheaper than uh, 15 cents per dollar. That's the, so in some way, it's a cost reduction strategy, right? If you reduce the cost, then you have a cost advantage and uh, you become more competitive in terms of your prices. The, but uh, a side effect of this uh, cost reduction or, or, or this uh, IRVs is that customers who tend to be cheaters, right? Uh, you know, if I, um, you know, my, I, I make a living out of cheating, cheating insurance companies, although it's illegal, right? They won't go to to progressive because they cannot cheat now because you know everything is transparent. The IRV will come up, will assess the damage, and they'll give them check immediately, right? So, uh, so these IRVs are probably preventing cheaters to come on board. So uh, it's a, it's a it's a beautiful thing. So in that case, you are going after the customers that are honest and uh, customers who tend to be uh, more profitable. The third one they did was uh, uh, comparison quotes in the sense that uh, somehow they, you know, uh, there's a lot of information about uh, driver safety in the U.S. here uh, because any ticket that you receive from, you know, in the, in the highway or, you know, parking is all kind of recorded in a national database so uh, they have information uh, about uh, the client solvability the driving behavior which they combine to come up with a risk measure uh, or risk metric about the customer there are risky customers and non risky customers the risky customers tend to uh, to be charged higher prices than the non risky customers so this is what we call price discrimination Right, so uh, by comparison quotes, if for example Abdullah calls, and uh, they immediately on the spot they measure his risk profile, and suppose he's a risky one, then they'll give him a higher rate uh, than the competition. The competition. They also tell him the rate about other competitor by the, by the way, but if he is a safe driver, they give him a cheaper one. Right. So basically, they're trying to attract the safe driver, and encouraging the risky driver to go elsewhere. Of course, it's possible because they have a database on the risk of drivers, right? Uh, if you don't have that database, then it's really tough to, 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 to implement this. So that's why I mentioned in my uh, one of the latest slides that you need to have some intelligence infrastructure. I hope I answered the question. Uh, okay, um, let's move to another one uh, from Brother Issam al Ghamdi. Uh, is there a customer centricity module? Uh, to follow? Uh, uh, well, uh, <laughs> uh, I'm going to Medina in May to uh, mm -hmm. to teach a customer strategy uh, kind of uh, module, and uh, I will talk about this, you know, again in some way. But the only difference is that we'll have uh, interactions, uh, and I'll talk about many other things, uh, many of the components. This is because this is like an introduction to it. Uh, but, uh, you know, at Columbia we offer a customer statistics module uh, for two or three days. But I don't know for miles whether they, are, they want to offer something of this kind. Yeah, but I think uh, that would be the time when it will be touched upon also when you'll come. So, so let's move to the next question from uh, Magadaleno Bergamento. Would determining and analyzing customer needs and preferences be important in developing products and services? Certainly, uh, certainly. Uh, you know, uh, from a marketing point of view, I don't think customer statistics is new. It's um, because in marketing, what do we, we tell people? You need to understand people preferences, their people perception, their latent needs, and whatever. 
whatever it is, and uh, we segment them uh, in terms of uh, needs and uh, value. So in some way, we are trying to kind of combine segmentation with uh, understanding the preferences. And the idea is that as a company, you have to decide uh, which segments that you should go after. So that's uh, so in some way this is customer centricity defined for CPG consumer package good company for, for some you know for some reason, but um, for company that they have data on their customers, uh, like if you are a retailer like Tesco, right? Uh, you have these loyalty cards and these loyalty cards tell you what people buy, uh, how people react to your promotions. Uh, you know uh, you can come up with a measure of share of wallet then you can study the you can do a lot uh, to study the to learn from the behavior of your, of your consumers to guide your strategy and your segmentation so in some way we are moving from preference perception uh, the traditional market research to some kind of uh, uh, making marketing decision based on people's behavior that's the the move in some way uh, of course, this move requires that you have a database of uh, of customers. Um, uh, yes, uh, we have another uh, hand raised, so let me try to give uh, Mazen uh, Nashmon. Could you hear us? And could you please introduce yourself and ask the question? Uh, Mazen Nashmon, can you hear us? Uh, I believe you have an uh, audio issue here. So let's move um, to another question uh, <coughs> from uh, in the chat box from uh, Brother Faisal Dail. To which extent customer centricity applies in B two B markets? Yeah, actually, uh, it's emergent happened with B two B first. You know, uh, because the nice thing about B two B is that uh, you have all the information you need about your customer and sometimes you have face-to-face -face interaction with that customer. Uh, you know, for me, if I push it to the limit, uh, you know, marketing is at best when we, whenever you have face-to-face -face interaction. In the old days, in the 1800s, uh, you know, or early 1900, before the Industrial Revolution, uh, you know, when you go to a weaver to get to make a blanket, you know, or you go to a tailor to tailor a suit, you know, you have one-to-one -one connection, and uh, that one-to-one -one connection is, uh, you know, is uh, is a very very interesting because the provider is interacting directly with the customer, and you can see whether the customer is happy or not. If happy, then you get rewarded. If on, and you can charge accordingly. Uh, if the customer is unhappy, you try to do something to keep that customer happy. Uh, so, um, with the industrial revolution, somehow they put a wall between us and the customers. And uh, you know, this early stories in in marketing is that uh, Ford that you say you know Ford Motor said that you can get any car, any car, any 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 car you want as long as it is black. So it's, we moved to kind of mass production, and without regard to customer uh, needs and preferences, but with the information technology. Now we are moving back to kind of even one-to-one -to -one marketing. So I believe business B2B is kind of much more ripe to customer centricity than to than actually you know B2C kind of things because you know as long as you have information, you have infrastructure, uh, ways to understand the customer, uh, and building that and having the idea that you are building a long-term relationship as compared to short-term relationship, you are on the on the right spot here. Okay, so uh, sir, um, let's move to another one in the chat box. Uh, customer mind has a different and highly tailored approach to customer research. With an increased understanding of customer psychology, could you elaborate a bit about further investing in neuromarketing? Any examples you could share about organizations who are practicing it? Yeah. Uh, you know, there are tons of ways of learning about the customers. Uh, the traditional marketing research of focus groups, uh, of interviews, questionnaires, uh, observational studies, uh, you know, are not going to die. They'll be there all the time. But uh, there are new techniques, uh, new things that are emerging. Uh, you know, I mentioned earlier how uh, Starbucks is, uh, is uh, you know, 
leveraging the internet uh, and uh, you know the their community to share ideas. So that's uh, one trend. Uh, I, I, I talked about JetBlue's and how they uh, you know uh, listen to their customer stories by having a website where people come in and comment on it. Um, uh, there are uh, even an internet folks group these days. You don't really need to have face to face. You can do it over the internet. There is what we call text mining, where people write about your brand, uh, whether on Facebook or blogs or uh, you know uh, you know internet stories. And uh, there are techniques that is called uh, text mining that can allow you to learn about what people say. Uh, so uh, uh, the next thing is you mentioned this neuroscience. Uh, yes, I think uh, you know it is at its infancy, and. Uh, it's providing new insights. Uh, they tend to be expensive, uh, and they tend to, you know, require smaller sample sizes because you, you know you need to have a CAT scan machine or a camera machine, and those are very expensive. But they're providing uh, nice insights. An, an example, a classic example here, here is done uh, to compare people's perception of Coke and Pepsi. So one group of people. Uh, you know, were, show, were uh, put into an fMRI or CAT scan machine, and they were, uh, you know, show, you know, given, you know, tastes of uh, of Coke while they're in the machine, and they're trying to see what area of the brain would uh, light up when they drink Coke. They tell them, of course, Coke. And another group of people, uh, they were show, you know, uh, given Pepsi, and they try to monitor where, what area of the brain uh, would light up uh, if they were uh, if they are tasting Pepsi. And surprisingly, that the when people drank Coke, it led to a different area of the brain than uh, than uh, than Pepsi. So uh, for Coke, it was all the area that leads with nostalgia and memories and uh, uh, positive association. For Pepsi, was you know the some kind of more judgmental, more more judgmental, more cognitive kind of area. Uh, yes, uh, you know uh, there are tons of ways of uh, learning about the customer. Uh, you know, customer centricity is really learning. You know, from you know establishing a database of your customer, and think of that customer not as a source of how to promote them, but a source to learn from their behavior, and using them as a as a springboard to as a, a springboard to introduce them to new innovation, to get them to buy other things, and to uh, you know ha you know help you refer customer and do many things. So uh, it is. Uh, it's really looking at the customer as assets, as a source of growth. Right. Uh, uh, just to give you an example here, um, Tesco. Uh, you know, typically, I teach a case on Tesco. Uh, that's what I'm talking about right now. And for Tesco, uh, uh, they uh, when they introduced the uh, internet shopping, it was much easier than them than any new entrant. Uh, the cost of acquisition for Tesco was twenty dollars. Why is it cheap? It's or actually the, for the competition, it was the cost of acquiring a new customer is around two hundred dollars. Why is it cheap? It's cheap because they have like uh, fifteen million or so customers. They already, uh, you know, uh, know them, and therefore it became like an email sent to their customer on the cheap. But the other important thing is most internet sh you know shopping uh, services have failed. Very few have survived. Part of the reason why they failed, it's because uh, you know you cannot really put a supermarket on the internet. An average supermarket carries like around forty thousand items, and it's really you know at least in the old technology, it's tough to kind of uh, navigate a supermarket easily. Uh, what Tesco did cleverly is that they didn't put the whole supermarket because they know their customers they just restricted themselves to the product that this customer buy they know what they buy in the past let's say 30 to 40 items they just show them that right and that removed the huge barrier for adoption right and uh, so you 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 cut your customer acquisition cost by quite a bit and you also remove barrier to adoptions and the third thing is when a message comes from tesco you tend to trust it because you love that company so that's my answer. Okay, <coughs> sir, um, that really now brings towards the end of the webinar. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Kamal Jadidi, for your time and sharing this valuable information with our participants. Uh, and uh, thank you, everyone who participated. Um, uh, 
again, uh, Dr. Tiriri, I would like to thank you on behalf of Mar uh, for your time. Uh, with this, uh, just a final note, uh, folks, that um, uh, we are having other webinars being announced on our website and programs for which you can visit www.mile.org. Uh, we have been receiving a lot of comments appreciating this webinar, uh, Dr. Jadidi. So we will be sharing the recorded version of this webinar in about a week time once it's uploaded on our YouTube channel and blog. Meanwhile, if you have any other questions, you can always email and we can forward it to Dr. Jadidi. Thank you, Ali, and thank you, everybody, for listening. Uh, I hope uh, we didn't waste your time. I, uh, I enjoyed it, and uh, hopefully you enjoy it, too. Uh, absolutely, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, with that, I'm going to close the webinar, and you all will be automatically dismissed out. Thank you very much.